Okay, meanwhile, rare protests swept across China this weekend. Here you see police in Shanghai arresting and dragging demonstrators through the street. Police, protesters, excuse me, in several Chinese cities, including Beijing, are voicing their opposition to the country's highly restrictive COVID policies. These protests were sparked by a deadly fire in Xinjiang province. At least 10 people were killed, and demonstrators suggest rescue attempts were hindered by lockdown measures. Here to discuss is Guy Saint-Jacques. He previously served as Canada's ambassador to China. Guy is near Quebec City. Guy, these images coming out of China, they're, they're just stunning. I mean, we've seen this in Hong Kong, but how unprecedented is it to see protests like this on, in mainland China, especially under President Xi? <clears throat> well, you're right, David. This is uh, unprecedented until uh, since uh, Xi Jinping was elected. And I would say uh, the last time that we had a such lar a large protest was uh, around the uh, Tiananmen events back in June uh, 1989. So that's uh, 33 years ago. Uh, and I think it just shows how people are fed off with the uh, zero COVID approach. Police, though, uh, stepped up their presence in, in several Chinese cities to crack down on these protests. I mean, what kind of repercussions could these protesters face? <clears throat> well, I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the people were very courageous to uh, go on, uh, on the street to, uh, to protest. Uh, the, those who uh, spoke up and called for Xi Jinping to uh, resign or uh, uh, be taken away uh, for, uh, for sure will be arrested, will face very stiff uh, 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 penalties, uh, uh, prison uh, terms. Uh, and, you know, you, you have to understand that uh, there are surveillance uh, camera everywhere, that there were uh, uh, policemen going in the crowd, uh, uh, taking pictures, uh, filming uh, who were demonstrating. But the fact that it happened in so many cities at the same time uh, clearly shows that uh, it's the danger for autocratic uh, regime when you don't leave any uh, possibility for people to let the steam off. Uh, you know, they, they will take advantage of uh, an event uh, like the unfortunate uh, passing of 10 people uh, in that uh, uh, fire in Urumqi uh, last week to, uh, to get out. But I think the, war, the, the, the regime obviously will want to increase the repression, but uh, this is not over yet. You, you, you mentioned it was in several cities at the same time, but I, I don't believe there are any signs of protest, at least on Monday, in Beijing or in Shanghai. Uh, so do you anticipate these protests might spring up again? Well, I think if there is a, another incident or... Uh, and I think you have to understand when you, you look at, the, at who was demonstrating, it, there were lots of young people in... The uh, unemployment rate bit, uh, for people age uh, 16 to 24 is uh, around 18 percent. And there's lots of dissatisfaction uh, among uh, young people in China. The economy is not going well. The uh, real estate sector uh, is not going well. Uh, and in fact, the, the problem for uh, Xi Jinping regime is that when you look at the cities that are confined in China, it represents close to one third of the Chinese uh, uh, GDP. So this is having a huge uh, impact. Uh, add to this that the exports to the United States were down 12.6 percent in October. That's on top of a drop of 11.6 percent in September. And you have there the, the conditions that... Uh, uh, could generate more dis dissatisfaction. And I think the only solution for Xi Jinping, uh, and this uh, uh, hopefully will come uh, sooner than later, will be to do a, a major shift in the approach to address uh, COVID-19. Right. I, I want to talk about a, a shift in approach uh by Canada in its approach towards the Indo-Pacific region, with China in particular, because China is responding on Monday to Canada's new Indo-Pacific strategy. And a spokesperson for the Chinese ministry said the strategy is, quote, dominated by ideological bias and hypes up the so-called China threat and makes unwarranted accusations against China. I mean, we see that kind of rhetoric coming from China all the time. I mean, is any of that surprising in, in response to this? <clears throat> uh, not at all. And in fact, you know, uh, we cannot expect... Uh, an honest uh, uh, response from uh, from Beijing. And in fact, they have only themselves to blame for the the, the radical change in uh, Ottawa's approach to uh, to China. Uh, in fact, we have learned a lot in the last uh, few years uh, uh, on uh, <clears throat> China uh, 
not respecting international laws, taking people hostage, uh, punishing countries very severely. We have learned also about the, the very severe repression that is taking place in places like Xinjiang, Tibet, Mongolia, the, uh, all the, uh, the complete disappearance of democracy in Hong Kong. And so when you had all this up, uh, I think the only uh, response for Ottawa was to uh, adopt a much firmer uh, language towards uh, China. What will be interesting to see is how will this translate in terms of working with allies to, to build stronger alliances to push back on China. Well, and th that's where I wanted to go with the next question, because this strategy, the Indo-Pacific strategy, it says Canada is going to bolster its military presence in the region, a third frigate, more, um, you know, activities and training, uh, and more military exercises and training. But, but it's quiet on some of these emerging security and military forums and packs in the Indo-Pacific, like Quad and AUKUS. Is, is that the sort of thing Canada <clears throat> should be pursuing, trying to get membership in these groups? Well, I would say overall that uh, I, I was quite pleased to see the, uh, the strategy when uh, it came out, because uh, when you look at the five objectives uh, set by Minister Jolie, uh, they cover the, the, the full range of uh, issues that I think we need to address. It goes from national security, uh, defense, to development, uh, environment and climate change, trade, of course, and uh, political relations. Uh, in terms of the uh, military approach, I think sending uh, a third frigate to, uh, to uh, Asia <clears throat> uh, will uh, send a, a very po a positive sign to countries in the region. It sends, of course, a message to China that uh, Canada is becoming uh, more serious. What is also interesting is the introduction of this new concept related to the security in the Pacific North. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if the government is honest, uh, it will realize that uh, uh, we will have to invest a lot more in uh, our military if we want to do a better job to protect the, uh, the northern part of the Pacific and also uh, our uh, uh, Arctic. Uh, and uh, unless we do that, I think that uh, Ottawa realized that it, uh, there's no point in trying to join the Quad or uh, AUKUS at, at this stage. We just uh, don't bring enough to the table? Is that the basic idea? The military capacity <clears throat> yeah. and muscle isn't there? Yeah, I, I, in fact, you know, the, uh, the strength of our military has been going down uh, in recent years. There is a, a problem uh, of a shortage of manpower. But clearly, we need to invest a, a lot more. Uh, and that's why, by, uh, at some point, I think we will have to uh, buy more ships, uh, buy uh, more planes. This will help to protect sovereignty uh, in, in the Arctic and also to, to be able to deploy more resources uh, to, to have a physical presence uh, in, uh, in Asia. And that, that would be very useful to reassure our allies uh, in the countries that we are trying to, uh, to court to <clears throat> develop more uh, closer relations in uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Okay. Gisei Chok, thank you so much for your time as always. Thank you.